prosecutor uh, here in this town for 28 years. I've talked to a lot of juries, and I don't think I've ever had to stand up for one and start out apologizing for delaying, uh, causing you to spend more time here than uh, you would have otherwise, because uh, Mr. little Mr. Flubug jumped on me last week and uh, felt about as bad as I've ever felt. You know, those, like have to get better to die, but uh, I'm back now, and you spent a lot of time with us. We started back in the middle of October before Halloween. We went through Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, and now here we are on Dr. King's birthday, and we're still at it. Uh, I think I speak for everybody connected to this trial, and we thank you for your patience with us, your attentiveness, uh, and your service as citizens in this county. And as I said, um, little Mr. Flubug jumped on me. All the medicine in my medicine cabinet and the doctors that I could call uh, just wouldn't make it go away. And I just couldn't get up and go. And as I'm sitting there in bed at, looking at the stuff I'm trying to take to make me feel better, it occurs to me that it's sort of a parallel here uh, with this case. Sharika Adams, she was just a, a little late, petite person. In the last few weeks, I contend we've seen an effort to try to make her go away, to disappear. We've had wide receivers and defensive backs and running backs, full backs. We've had anesthesiologists and clinical psychologists. We've had a witness in the box. Ron Jarrett, need a witness? Here's Jarrett, pop. We even had Henry Lee, star from the OJ case, come down here from Connecticut to, to talk with us about well, same thing Dr. Sullivan had already told us, and that your own common sense would tell you about those gunshots. He's a nice man, a nice diversion. And that's what this is all about, diversion. To get your mind off of the evidence against that man right there, Ray Carew. Sharika Adams' words, like Alice Walker's character, Cal, despite all that you've heard, all that they put up here, Sharika is still here. She's a voice saying to you, Ray Carruth did this, and he's guilty. They attacked her. How? With Elizabeth Loftus, I contend a reject from the American Psychological Association. Tells you, oh no, that was just a coincidence that I withdrew from the most prestigious organization in my profession. And it just happened to be at the time when there were ethical violations against me just happened to be that time. The memory expert that sits up here and can't remember half of what's on the 911 tape that she's supposed to be testifying about. And that's not the worst part. That exchange that David Rudolph and Elizabeth Loftus engaged in Wherein they're telling you that this family has suffered so much pain, so much heartache at the hands of that man right there. Jeff Mooney, Sandra Adams, one. And somehow they sneaked into that dying daughter's hospital room and suggested to her 
that she ought to say something that was not the truth about who had done that to her. My gosh. Brings to mind when I read about the McCarthy hearings back in 54 when Joseph Welch had about up to here with McCarthy's unfounded accusations, calling people communists without one shred of evidence of it. And he turned to McCarthy and he said, Senator, I don't think until this moment I gauged your cruelty, your recklessness. Have you, sir, no sense of decency? Have you at last no sense of decency? Sheree Giles, she's still here. That's the voice talking with you today. What she went through to be here, the pain that she endured, to tell you Before we left his house, he called someone and said, we're leaving now. This is not coming. She'd been set up. She knew it. He never came back. He left me. He never came back. He blocked the front of my car. He stopped in the road. And the car pulled up and shot him. Shriek Adams told us, Ray Cruz stopped and blocked her. She was shot and he left her. What's the physical facts about this case? The physical facts about this case confirm that Sharika Adams was stopped and that the car from which the shots were fired was stopped. Remember Dr. Sullivan's testimony that the shot patterns in that car, his examination of the maximum and the BMW that there was a static relation between those two cars. Static, changeless, rigid, fixed position. Henry Lee, his testimony was consistent with that, certainly. He said that there were three shots, dead on straight, into the window. And then two more shots at a slight angle, very slight angle. Both Dr. Sullivan and Henry Lee agreed. Either the difference between those angles was either a slight movement, Henry Lee says by Sharika's car, Dr. Sullivan says by Shear car, but anyway, a slight movement of one of those cars from point A to point B of not more than nine inches. Or, I contend more likely, a slight change of position of the gun in the shooter's hand, 10 degrees. Another fact, Sharika was leaning to the right almost in a prone position. And those shots went into her side, ripped into her stomach and into her body. You remember the the illustration that Dr. Sullivan drew on the board, cross-examined about it by David Rudolph, in Lee agreed that looked about right, that she was over, almost prone in that seat, trying to get away from those shots. Your common sense tells you she's not stopped, and she's over here, she's gonna be wrecking, that car's gonna be going off the road. She stopped. Physical facts tell you that. Sharika Adams tells you that. 
another fact in this case. It was dark out there. Very dark. You heard that not only from Farrell Blaylock, who lives out there. Remember him talking about walking to the fence and looking down in the bottom? Inky black down in the dip. You heard that from Officer Peter Grant, who patrols that area out there. He says there's not any lights out there. Dark. You even heard that from Pop Up Ron. I asked him about it, and he said, yeah, he'd been through there, and it was inky dark in that area. Why would a young, expectant mother driving in a car alone stop on this dark road? Because some strange car? Is it? Van Watkins? Obviously not. The common sense and Sharika Adams' words tell you why. Because he let her right into that trap. Ray Carruth stopped and she stopped. That's why she stopped in that road. Other facts, trying to guess. The bullets found in the storm drain at Stonecrest Shopping Center, right beside the Chick-fil-A, right beside the traffic light, looking out on Ray Road. The bullets in that storm drain matched the shell casings and the murder weapon found on Elm Lane. There were no prints, no fingerprints on the murder weapon. Van Watkins told you that Stanley Abraham wiped down, wiped down the bullets in the gun. Michael Kennedy and Van Watkins told you Watkins had gloves, mask. This was no spontaneous rage shooting. Planned hit premeditated murder. That was the defendant's plan. However, this little lady was a whole lot harder to kill than he ever figured out. <clears throat> Nicole Michael said, Nicole Michael, the emergency medical technician that arrived in the ambulance there in the front yard of Farrell Blaylock's house. Nicole said she was humbled, humbled by Sharika's strength and resolve to hold on. To hold on for her baby, and to hold on for you, I contend, to tell you what happened. I'm going to ask you to hear that 911 tape again. And I ask you to listen to one tough little lady putting up a heck of a fight for life. Hers and her baby's. Listen to, in that tape, the clarity of thought from Sharika Adams. There's no head injury here. She wasn't head shot. She hadn't been in a wreck. There wasn't anything wrong with her head. She was gut shot. Right in the stomach. Most painful way to be shot and maintain consciousness. Agonizing pain she was going through. And you've heard that. You know the pain that she was experiencing, but she was holding on. And I'd ask you to listen as she directs and even corrects the 911 operator. Breaks in at one time when he's spelling phonetically and says, no, no, MSN. She obviously was not familiar with phonetic spelling. Anybody not been in the military may not be either, but she was going, you know, alpha, beta, whatever. And she said, no, 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 and, and gave the letters. They passed me. You listen to me now, lady. No, you listen to me. They passed me. And he 
operator has to correct them and bring them back. So I just listen, ask you to listen. I'm going to play that tape again.
Sharika surviving to tell Farrell Blaylock, Officer Grant, and Nicole Michaels what he had done to them. You heard all three of those folks tell you that they heard Sharika say the defendant, her baby's daddy, boyfriend, shot her. She's not confused. You hear that on the tape. That's a shorthand statement of facts that she's telling them under very difficult circumstances. Shorthand statement summary of facts that he was present, participating in, and responsible for trying to kill her. Now you remember that Nicole Michael said there was no medications given to Sharika there in the ambulance or at the scene. They started giving her fluids to help the blood pressure situation and rushed her to the hospital from McAndrew Drive. And Dr. Thomason, the head of the trauma surgery department at Carolina's Medical Center, was in the emergency room when she arrived. And you recall he said that she was awake and talking when she came into the emergency room and that more fluids were given in the emergency room and that the blood pressure problem situation was stabilizing, was improving. Officer Grant said that he walked along beside the gurney that Sharika was being taken to the operating room on. And as he walked along the gurney, he was talking with her and she was alert. She was talking with him and telling him what happened. And he confirmed what she had told him at the scene. That is, he asked her to confirm the statements that she had made out there. Did your boyfriend do this? Nodded her head just, and then she went on to tell him about having been at the movies with the defendant, uh, that they were going back to her apartment, uh, driving down Ray Road. She couldn't understand why he stopped in the middle of the road. And this other car, just like she told the 911 operator, he asked her about that. Well, tell me about this car the shots came from. She said, well, she really didn't get a look at that car. She didn't tell much at all about that car, except uh, she said it might have been a dark color. Well, actually, the Maxima is gold and almost tan. But I suspect a white car would have looked dark out there in that part of Ray Road. In the operating room, Dr. Thomason again said he was there waiting for surgery when she was brought into the operating room. She was awake and talking. He said that Chancellor Adams was so close to death that when they took him by the emergency C-section, Bullet. But the bullet just missed him by an inch. <laughs> now again, 
Let's think about who sees Sharika here. Not some anesthesiologist from Durham talking about what's in a book. Not some non-clinical psychologist opining about what she thinks happened. And you've heard from a man who's been working with patients day in and day out. He's blood in their hands, his hands in their blood, trying to save lives all his whole career. Mike Thompson. He saw her that morning. He said, I saw her writing on that clipboard for Nurse Willard. He says, drugs affect different people different ways. That's been his experience and his observation from working and reading and studying. And that his observation of Sharika Adams that morning, when these notes were written, he was impressed with how oriented and alert she was. She knew what she was doing. Tracy Willard, an experienced trauma care nurse, who does this day in and day out. And he's helped folks write out these, these uh, notes uh, in the past. She says, her observations, she's mentally alert. And she has restraints on. And she's <laughs> frantically, Sharika is frantically trying to communicate something with her. And she goes over and she explains to her why her hands are in restraints. You know, we, we don't want somebody that's not in control of their faculties pulling the tubes out of their mouth or their side or their or their arms hurting themselves. Of course there's another reason. Be, if they didn't do that, to be held negligent and sued. So she wanted to make sure that she understood that her mind was clear before she took off those restraints. Sharika understood. She untook and tied her hands and she started trying to sign. Sign on. Tracy Willard said, I don't sign. She pointed at her stomach. She had two things on her mind, two priorities, two focuses. You tell me, is my baby alive? Mr. Willard said yes. And I'm going to tell you what that man did to me. And she started giving a signal she wanted to write. The nurse would have got the pad. And she wrote it. And she told us what that man did to her. While Sharika, the Chancellor, are clinging to life there in the trauma intensive care section of Carolina's Medical Center, let's take a look at what Ray Ruth's doing. What's going on with him? When he gets to Carolina's Medical Center, he's sure not the cool, laid-back Ray Carruth you've heard portrayed here in his courtroom by his witnesses. <laughs> he's wound tighter than a snare drum. So edgy, he's about to explode. Hands are shaking. Comes in and plops down on the floor. Say a word to him. Wanda Mooney, Jeff's wife, goes over to him and says, you know, Ray, we, you were with Sharika earlier. I need you about, about coming out and talking with us and tell us what, you know, what might have happened. What happened to our girl? He jumps up, peels off his coat, storms out in the hall like he's ready to fight somebody. <laughs> Sandra Adams comes up to him and says, Did you shoot my baby? It was this kind, caring, 
Ray Carruth that you heard described here in this witness stand do, he bucks up in her face. He says, I didn't come down here for this. That's the reason I started not to come down here. Started not to come down here. Gosh, this baby, his witnesses say he's so looking forward to. Sharika Adams been shot at the hospital and he started not to come down here. Brings to mind a, something David Rudolph said in his open statement, repeated. Why? Because that's the kind of guy Ray Crook is. Let me talk a minute about Sharika and her family. Remember Nicole Michael talking about Sharika out there? Here's this woman. Gotcha. Agonizing pain. Not knowing whether she and her baby are going to see the next minute. Live or die. What would she say? Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. To the ambulance lady. Sandra Adams, her mother. What do you remember about what she said later to Ray Carew after the scene there in the hall? She came up to him and said, I'm sorry for what I said to you. That's my only child in there. And I'm upset. Showed him the picture. Champion. Invited him to go up. Look at the baby with her. She's a good, kind, and caring person. But if she'd known that her daughter, if she'd known at that point her daughter had said, Ray Carruth shot me, Ray Carruth was involved in this, Ray Carruth was responsible for this, even a good, kind, caring lady like that is not going to be walking over saying, I'm sorry. I don't know what I said. Officer Grant said he didn't give the family any case-sensitive information. Didn't want to prejudice the investigation. It's consistent with Sandra Adams' actions with the defendant. But the family had their suspicions. I mean, Sandra knew that the defendant had been with her daughter earlier that evening. You didn't need Peter Grant to tell her that. She had talked with her on the phone in Carruth's house. Said so going to the movies. So there were suspicions. And then Officer Grant said he gave Sharika's purse to the family and her sisters started going through in that purse and saying, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. All our money's here, all our credit cards. This wasn't any robbery. What's going on here? Suspicions are turning towards Ray Carruth, sure. They're making comments that Candace Smith hears and Ray Carruth hears. Now, we're going to get to the bottom of this. And earlier, earlier in the evening, Sandra Adams, when she called from Carolina's Medical Center, she left a message on his phone, on his answering machine, and also a message on his pager, one of those message writing pager services. The message was that Sharika had been shot, it was in critical condition, in the hospital, the message was that you tried to kill my daughter. But you know Ray Carew's feeling panicky when he gets this message. What am I going to do? Do I run? Do I take off? Ah, that's a sure admission of guilt. Maybe she'll die yet. Maybe she'll never regain consciousness. 
Maybe she'll be in a vegetable state after this. Got to go to the hospital. The con guy. I'm a charmer. Maybe I can carry this off yet. So he goes down there. He's on edge. He's on edge when he gets there. It's clear from his eye what he said and what he does. And then those suspicions are turning more on him. So he's find the purse with all the property present. That's the atmosphere. That's what's going on in Ray Cruz's head when Officer Wallen arrives that morning. Remember, he was asked to go over there to Carolina's Medical Center and stand by. There's no other instructions, just stand by. And he went over there and he was standing near where Ray Ruth was sitting on the floor out there in the hall with the young woman with him that we now know is Candace Smith. And he heard Ruth tell this woman to get him some food, saw him give him some money, and she left to get him some food. Nothing had been said between Officer Wallen and the defendant at that point. And then out of the blue, the defendant looks up at Wallen and says, are you guys gonna put me in handcuffs and cover my head? Wallen stunned. Testified it sounded like an admission of guilt to him. Just was really surprised. Not only that, but Karifa asked if the police had the hospital surrounded and if the media was outside, neither of which was the case. So that was the state of mind of the defendant when Candace Smith returned from getting him something to eat. And Officer Wallen walked off, went down the hall, on the other end of the hall talked to some other officers. That was his state of mind when he made the admissions to Candace Smith at the hospital. I wish he'd just die. Get out of my life. Said to Candace that he'd been trying to be nice to her, been giving her money, trying to keep her happy. Said he'd been pulling money out little at a time to give to the guys so it wouldn't look suspicious. He said they were riding down the road and he hit the brakes to slow her down. And that the guys pulled beside her and started shooting. That he left and went to Hamilton's. He said to Candace, his friend, I can't go to jail. I just can't go to jail. He said, I'll have to get, and excuse my language, but a butt plug if I go to jail. He said, if I go to jail, you might as well get out your black dress, because I'm going to kill myself. He asked her, I, I can't get in trouble, can I, because I didn't shoot a gun. I didn't shoot the gun. I didn't fire the shots. He said, you're not going to tell on me, are you? She said, no, I'm not. And she did. She didn't tell the police what he had told her there at the hospital that morning. She didn't tell anybody for a long time, except Charles Shack. What she did do, what Candace Smith did do, is in that morning and the next day, she severed dead in its tracks, no more contact with that murderer. She said, you leave me alone. Now this is the woman you remember had been crazy about Ray Curry. Had cared for him since she first met him the summer before that, back in 98. Perhaps pursued all those calls that David Rudolph asked her about. All that contact, the jealousy. It all stopped dead on the 16th of November. Why? Why did she 
suddenly end any contact with that man. Because she'd seen the other side of Rachel Ray. She'd seen what he's capable of. I'm scared of the death. Now you've seen these phone records, huge books of phone records that the defense have brought in here. Not one phone call between Candace Smith and Ray Carew after that last call when he tried one more time on the 17th to get her to talk to him. Not only that, but in those phone records, there's no record of any phone calls ever, ever between Van Brett Watkins or the Villager Lodge and Candace Smith. There's no record of any phone calls between Candace Smith and Michael Kennedy, except for the two calls Ray Carruth made from Kennedy's cell phone the 15th when he called Candace about the call. No record of any calls from Candace Smith and Stanley Abraham. Nothing. Only connection between those three co-defendants of the defendant. And Candace Smith is a defendant. She had seen him a couple of times with him. Now, the defense puts up a witness, Elise Alexander, I believe her name was, a woman that had been a waitress at the, uh, some restaurant. And she told you that she had seen Candace Smith and Van Watkins on more than just a few occasions in other places than just in strip clubs. Now, Candace Smith said on the stand that she knew New York. She'd seen him around. She knew him slightly, which is consistent with what Van Watkins said. So perhaps, what's the deal here? Well, maybe Van Watkins was around Candace Smith more than she was aware. Maybe he was on the fringe of the crowd that she was running with and of no consequence to her and really didn't notice him. Or maybe, perhaps, Elise Alexander is exaggerating. Perhaps she got one of those letters of instructions like Amber Turner got. This is what you testify to. Or perhaps Candace Smith does know Van Watkins more than she said. I don't know, but whatever is the, those case, is the case from those possibilities. What the defense is contending or suggesting to you, I guess, is there some sort of conspiracy between Van Watkins and Candace Smith and maybe Michael Kennedy to put this off of Van Watkins and it's Michael Kennedy and Owen Ray Carruth to uh, bring him? Is that what they're suggesting? Well, what sense does that make? If that were the case, if that's what they were about, Candace Smith tell the police Van Watkins and Michael Kennedy are contract mur killers, murderers? which is exactly what she's told them. You say, well, Gentry, how about what Sergeant Riddle testified about? How about that phone call uh, that she says she heard Van Watkins make? How about that? Where she says she heard him say Candace and Michael. Well, I can tell you this real question about what Sergeant Riddle heard. But even if you accept that her testimony that she heard what she said she heard, consider the content of what she said she heard Van Watkins say. Tell Candace, don't talk to the police. Excuse me just a minute, Mr. Caldwell. I understand that uh, one or more of the jurors needs to take a brief recess, so uh, why don't we take about a 10-minute recess at this time?
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to allow you to step out uh, for a 10 minute recess. Please keep in mind and abide by my instructions as to your conduct. Uh, you're free to step out. I'll let them stay seated. Make it quiet. Go on, Neil. Thank you. I was talking about the <clears throat> testimony of Shirley Riddle. <laughs> she told you all about hearing a conversation on the phone that uh, Van Watkins had. And uh, her testimony was that she heard Van Watkins uh, say something about uh, tell Candace. And I first said, I put it to you, a serious question as to whether that is what she heard, whether it was Candace or Elise or some other name, but even assuming that he said Candace, and assuming it is the same Candace as Candace Smith that testified in this case, the content of what uh, she says she heard uh, Van Watkins say, uh, tell Candace, don't talk to the police. Not tell Candace that Ray Carruth paid uh, me and, and Michael Kennedy and, and Stanley Abraham to help him kill Sharika Adams. And let's, let me ask you to consider the testimony of Charles Shackelford, too, in deciding um, the truthfulness of the testimony of Candace Smith and weighing that testimony. Um, I'll put it to you that if, if Charles Shackelford uh, hadn't uh, believed what Candace told him, he would never have come in here and open court and put himself through the absolute agony uh, that he had to come in here uh, and admit publicly uh, to adultery. Charles Shackelford testified that Candace Smith never lied to him. He said that she didn't want to talk to the police. She didn't want to get involved. She had seen the OJ trial she told you about, and she had seen what uh, a skilled uh, attorney. Well, Your Honor, I'm going to object to references to the OJ trial. Well, the, um, the, the objections overruled. The uh, attorneys, ladies and gentlemen, are, uh, are free to argue what they contend the evidence shows, but what it does show is, in fact, for you to recall and determine, but they're also um, entitled to argue uh, what they contend are reasonable inferences to be drawn from the evidence. You may proceed, Mr. Coney. Thank you, and I contend to you that's exactly what she said on the stand. She'd seen that case, and she didn't want to get involved in something like this. And that's what she told Charles Shackleton. But she told him what Ray Caruth had told her. He said you need to talk to a lawyer about this. Now, you may not appreciate and shouldn't appreciate Charles Shackleford's adultery, but I say to you, you ought to appreciate that he came in here, took his medicine like a man, did the right thing. In his opening statement, David Rudolph said that I, in my opening statement, had not said anything about motive, and then he went on to tell you what he contends that I would contend that the motive is going to be, or the motive was, uh, and he said that he contends that I would contend that the motive is that the defendant murdered Sharika Adams to avoid paying child support. <coughs> Maybe I didn't use the word motive in opening statement, but I sure referred to it when I was talking about fact that Ray Carruth wanted Sharika Adams to get an abortion. He didn't want this baby. And she was adamant in her refusal. She wanted a child. And I talked about it was just miraculous that Chancellor Adams came into this world alive. referring to motive. Well, Chancellor is the motive. Ray Carruth wasn't going to have any more babies with any more women he didn't want to be with, and he didn't want to be with Candace Smith. 
Kent Sharik out. He was not going to have a baby with a woman he didn't even like, and he didn't like Sharika. Now, motive is not an element of either of these crimes the defendant is charged with. He certainly, his honor is going to tell you, and it makes common sense, you can consider motive or the absence of motive or more than one motive in deciding the case. And I submit there's more than one motive in this case. <coughs> the defendant didn't want a baby. He certainly didn't want a baby. Sharika. In addition to that, Sharika Adams, in his mind, was nothing but a nuisance, a pest. It was in the way. And she was going to be even more so with his child. It wasn't like she was on the other side of the continent, out in California, where he could ignore her and the child. She was right here. She's getting closer. She was going to move in right down, right down the road from him. She was closing in even more. Following him, calling him, checking up on him, riding by him. Embarrassing public scenes she was causing. He had this new woman in Atlanta, Alondia Cheney. She was in the way of that relationship. He really liked it. He was putting the full court press on Alondia Cheney. And here was this woman, Sharika Adams, that Candace Smith said he referred to as that crazy woman. Amber Turner said he referred to as that stripper girl. She was in his way. It was going to get worse with the child. And then there is the money. Yeah, that's a motive. Not the only motive, but that's a motive. Michael Kennedy testified. Ray Carruth told him Sharika was juicing him for money. Candace Smith testified, Ray Carruth said Sharika Adams was a gold digger, that she told him that that other son's mama out in California was crazy to be settling for just $3,000 a month. Let's do the math here for a minute. If he just continued to pay $3,000 a month, if he just continued to pay that, for a little Ray. And he paid just $3,000 for Chancellor until they were 18 years old. That's over a million dollars. That's a lot of motive in any league. And you may say to me, well, well how about these plea offers and this plea bargain with that scoundrel? Watkins. What about that? You may very much not like that concept, plea offers and plea bargaining with, with murderers. But I'd ask you to consider this. You are painfully aware uh, that we've been jury selection trial three months, trying one of four defendants in one case. This is not the only murder in trial. Not the only crime, in addition to murders, there's rapes and burglaries and all the other crimes. You heard testimony there's over a thousand prisoners over there awaiting trial in the jail. I hope that having lived through this, you might have some understanding as to why prosecutors feel pressured, compelled into making plea offers. You heard testimony that there were plea offers made to all four defendants, and the only one that accepted the offer was Van Watkins. Michael Kennedy testified he turned down offers twice, the first time when all four offers were made, and then when another offer was made to him, which was even more strict, more demanding than the first offer. That is, the price went up for pleading guilty 
as he dragged the case out with more and more strain. So the second offer was even stricter, tougher than the first offer, and he turned both down. Van Watkins certainly wouldn't be anybody's first choice for a witness. But I'll tell you, we intended to call him as a witness. We made the plea offer with him because all the juries that hear all the cases against all the defendants need to hear what happened in this case, need to hear about the planning, conspiracy, the luring of a young pregnant woman to the trap laid by this defendant. And as trial approached, Michael Kennedy came forward and said, I'm not going to plead guilty, but I'll come into court without a plea deal, and I'll tell that jury what happened. But we didn't call Van Watkins. We called Michael Kennedy. The defense called Van Watkins, and he testified before you that, yeah, he had made a plea deal with the state that saved him from the death penalty, would ensure that he'd be in prison the rest of his life. Michael Kennedy testified in this case and spent a day and a half, at least, under cross-examination by a very aggressive, skillful attorney, David Brudock. And I contend to you, he did very well, thank you. A very credible witness. Why? Is he some sort of extremely clever fellow? able to match wits with David Rudolph? No. He was credible. He was believable. Because he's telling the truth about what happened out there on Ray Road. Consistent with what Sharika told him. And that's what he told the police. Before there was any 911 tape was released or these notes were released or he told the police, consistent with what Sharika had said. Van Watkins testified before he had a lawyer, before there was any plea deal that he told the police what happened out there on Ray Road. And it was consistent with what Sharika said, what Michael Kennedy said. Certainly, there are inconsistencies between the testimony of Watkins and Kennedy about particulars. I mean, your common sense, your own experience, when you go back to deliberate, some of you are going to see things a little different or hear things a little different, and that's what the jury does. You deliberate and resolve those differences. And there were some differences, certainly, between Watkins and Kennedy's testimony. Uh, for instance, uh, Watkins said that when they went to the Waffle House, uh, Kennedy's son was with them. And as I recall, he said Hannibal Navius was with him. Um, Michael, um, Michael Kennedy, that's what Watkins said. Kennedy said there was Abraham, Watkins, Kennedy, and Carew. And obviously there were other inconsistencies. But what they said is what Sharika told you at the very beginning about what happened on Ray Road. Van Brett Watkins is a bad person. No doubt about it. He's an evil person. Career criminal. Confessed murderer. Michael Kennedy is a bad person. The drug dealer. And now has admitted in open court, under oath, to capital murder. He's a bad person. We didn't pick him. We didn't go out and select Van Watkins and Michael Kennedy. Ray Carruth picked him. They were his friends, his associates, people he ran with. Candace Smith testified that the first time she ever saw the gold tooth guy, she called him Kennedy, was when she was with when he came by with Carruth one day by her apartment, and he was with Carruth, and she recalled that he introduced Kennedy, she didn't remember his name, but introduced him as a real guy, one of the real guys, like back in the hood, 
not like those jocks. Ruth and Kenny ran again. The defendant's own evidence, all those books of phone records, between July the 6th and November the 15th, there were 44 calls to Ray Carruth to Van Watkins, or at least to the Villager Lodge. Between November the 9th and November the 15th, there were 23 calls. Ray Carruth to the Villager Lodge. Was it his friends? Now the defense says that uh, there was some information that they wanted uh, and that uh, they didn't get it when they wanted it. They said that there was a <coughs> sale, drug sale, cocaine sale by Michael Kennedy to a police officer working on undercover capacity and that they didn't get that information until Kennedy was testifying, as I recall. And are, are, are saying, I would, I would guess their contention is that, gee whiz, if they had had that file from the police department earlier, then they could have cross-examined Michael Kennedy more effectively and that they could have revealed that Michael Kennedy was a drug dealer as Michael Kennedy had already admitted he was on direct evidence. Yeah, I guess that's their contention. Um, but the thing about it is, you heard Officer Ensminger testify, the person that made that sale to Kennedy. And he told you, and was introduced, the file that they said that they wanted. And in the file was um, Ensminger talking about that he used an informant to go out and make a buy with Kennedy uh, and that he was then arrested for sale and possession with intent to sell and they got ready to go to court and the defense made a motion, um, the Kennedy's defense lawyer made a motion to reveal the informer's identity uh, and that's not the way the vice department does business. They don't burn their informants, I think is the term, and so rather than do that, they just, the charge against Kennedy was dismissed. And that was what's in his file. Well, one floor up in this room, this, this building, in the clerk's office, there's a file. It's a public file. And you saw that in the courtroom, too. And in that public file is everything that's in, every bit, as good a source of information about that undercover drug sale as that police file. In there, he was an undercover officer. He made a sale to Kennedy. He used an informant. He wanted an informant uh, revealed, and the case was dismissed. One floor up. Now, here's a defense team that can get confidential mental health records of Van Brett Watkins out of the state of New York, can get prison records out of New York, witness statements, police reports from another state but they can't walk up one flight of stairs and get the public record. I submit, no, they just want to lay back when it's convenient. It's a cover-up. Oh, it's a big cover-up. Divert your attention from the facts in this case. And then there's another situation where the defense complains about in the course of this trial. You remember there was testimony that after Michael Kennedy came forward and said, well, I'll tell the jury what happened without a plea deal, that we, the prosecutors, had our first and only opportunity to talk with Michael Kennedy. And on a Saturday morning, Michael Kennedy was brought over to the law enforcement center with his lawyer, and that uh, investigator Ward was there, and Jack Knight and David Graham and I were there, um, and we had a chance to talk with Michael Kennedy uh, about this murder. <clears throat> and then just before we began to talk with him, Investigator Ward said to David Graham, I talked to a guy in the jail that gave me some information about Kennedy drug dealing. Graham said, is it first hand, second hand? No, it's second hand, something of that nature. Anyway, whatever the information was, David Graham said, well, we're not going into that. You know, 
Excuse me, folks, we're trying a murder case, not a drug case. We had one chance to talk to Michael Kennedy. We had a lot to cover. We went in and talked about this murder, not about Michael Kennedy's drug dealings, which he admitted to on the stand anyway. If they had any complaints about not getting that information on a timely basis, and when they got it, Kennedy was still on the stand testifying. And, and the defense attorney said, well, gee whiz, I wish I could have gone out and, and investigated this uh, stuff that was in uh, Investigator Ward's information from this guy in the jail. And well, I could have really cross-examined him then. I could have really established he was a drug dealer then if I'd have had that information. For crying out loud, they established that he's a drug dealer. He admits that he's a drug dealer. And if they felt they needed to cross-examine him more about it, well, there was a lot of time that passed from the time of Michael Kennedy stepped off that witness stand and this trial ended. They could have gone out and investigated. They could have recalled Michael Kennedy. They could have called the person from the jail that they were so concerned about his information. But no, again, I want to sit back and yell, oh, it's a big cover-up. want to divert your attention. You know, the thing of it is that the only people that have said one thing throughout this entire trial about this murder of that little lady by this defendant on the 16th of November, the only people that said one thing about drugs being in any way involved in that contract murder. Three people. One's David Rudolph in his opening statement. And his honors won't tell you that's not evidence. And you shouldn't consider it as evidence. In, in addition to that, what he said is there's no evidence to support it. Of course you shouldn't consider it. Second person anything about drugs being in any way involved in the murder of Sharika Adams. Rodney Durrett. The defendant's investigator and instant witness tells you, oh, I know, I know. I looked at these phone records and I know this is a drug deal. Speculation, wild speculation, innuendo at best. <laughs> Somebody said to me why they pulled out my phone records, looked at my teenage daughter on the phone on the weekends talking to her friends about going out to the mall. They're going to be coming after me for drugs because I see that grouping right there every time I pick up my phone bill. No, Ron Jurette. He's a real disinterested witness, isn't he? <laughs> Believe him. And the other person. That's the only other person that has said anything about drugs being in any way involved in the murder of Sharika Adams. Tommy Stamps, guy from the jail. What'd he say? Oh, well, I heard some rumors around the jail. Some rumors. I bet he heard some rumors. Rumors from that guy right there trying to save his skin, Ray Carruth, starting those rumors. Well, who needs evidence when you got rumor and innuendo? But they're hanging their defense on. Let's look at some other facts involved in this case. These phone records that we've heard so much about. On the 15th of November of 99 at 1240 in the morning, there was a call from Ray Carruth to the Villager Lodge. There were five more calls that day between 935 in the morning and 812 at night. Ray Carruth to the Villager Lodge. There was a call from Ray Carruth to Michael Kennedy at 7.44 in the evening, the 15th of November. Ray Carruth called Sharika, I'm sorry, called Candace Smith from his house phone three times. 
and he called her twice from Michael Kennedy's cell phone, 824 to 842. Ray Carruth called Mike Melvin Billingsley to come over to his house. Why did he call Melvin Billingsley that particular evening? I submit to you that Melvin Billingsley was going to be the front end of his alibi. Here's Ray escorting his lady out to the expedition. They're going to the movie. Everything is just hunky-dory. He was trying to get Candace Smith to be the back end of his alibi, calling her, trying to get her to come over to his house. She wouldn't do it. And he was going to call Alondia Cheney to be the middle of his alibi. He had trouble with Candace Smith being the, the back end. They got to the movies, and lo and behold, here is Tanya Furt, perfect substitute as the back end of the alibi. When Sharika is in the bathroom, the defendant says to Hannibal Navy is in Tanya Ferguson's presence, well, I think I'll come over later to play some video games. Say anything about it. Sharika. It's okay. Well, call me first. <clears throat> so then they leave. And before Sharika comes out of the bathroom, Rake Ruth picks up a cell phone call to Michael Kennedy. You have a record of that phone call. 11.51 p.m. Cell phone <coughs> call, Rake Ruth cell to Michael Kennedy's cell. Submit to let him know that we're leaving the movies to go back to get her car to start on that road, that drive that he'd showed Kennedy already. Kennedy takes up his position at Stonecrest Shopping Center, right beside the, the drain there, beside Chick fil A, looking right at the light at um, Ray Road. Back at the defendant's house, house he springs on the Sharika that, well, Let's go over to your place for the night. Wait a minute, you invited me over here. This is the first time you've ever invited me to come here and stay with you. And now you're saying, let's go over to my house. What is going on? Your Honor, I object to counsel inventing dialogue that there's no testimony to support. Again, members of the jury, you to consider the evidence as you recall it uh, being testified to and um, reasonable inferences that you draw from that evidence. You may continue, Mr. Collier. At 12.02 a.m. on the 16th, there is a call from Ray Carew's house to Michael Kenny's cell phone. I contend to you to say it's going to take a little longer than I thought. After about 15 minutes of sweet talking, Sharika, he's got things back on track, ready to go. At 12.17.47, according to the defense phone records, the defendant calls Hannibal Navies and says he's coming over. Nothing about Sharika. He's coming over, setting up the back end of that alibi. Unbeknownst, as they say in the uh, old movies, to Ray Carruth, Sharika Adams takes out her cell phone and calls Madre, her cousin at home, and says, I need you to clean up. Ray's coming over. I mean, she's still trying to impress this man. You know, Ray's coming over. I need you to clean up. Well, I thought y'all were staying over there. Well, we're coming over. That call was at 12.19.08 a.m. While she's on the cell phone with Madre, she overhears the defendant in the kitchen on the phone saying, we're on the way which is what Michael Kennedy said he called and told him. Ray Carruth's house phone to Michael Kennedy's cell phone at 12 19 48. We are on the way. Sharika told 911 operator that before he left he called somebody. She told you. Through these notes. Before we left the house, he called someone, said we're leaving now. <laughs> we're leaving now. <clears throat> At 
Then I will contend to you, they're on the way, they're leaving the house. Contend to you, Sharif is going, what was that all about? Who's that? It's Hannibal. Don't, don't, don't pay attention to it. More fast talk. Into the car as they go. Rake Roof in the lead, Sharif are following. And at that point, he's ready to set up the middle of his alibi. He makes a cell call to Londia Cheney in Atlanta at 12.23 a.m. He gets her on the phone, makes sure she's there on the phone talking, talks for three minutes and 41 seconds, and then that call ends. 45 seconds after that call ends, the defendant makes a call to Michael Kennedy's cell phone, a star 82 call. One second call. I would contend to you that was a signal. Between the time that the first call to Cheney ended and that call, that starty two call to Michael Kennedy, as I said, it was 45 seconds. That was a sweep second hand on that clock on the wall. It's coming down 15 after. Be 45 seconds when it's back up to the top of the dial at 12. I'm going to shut up. Seven sixteen a.m. according to the defendant's evidence to their phone records. 22 seconds after that call, the defendant calls Alondia Cheney back. 22 seconds. Again, starting at the bottom at 30 after and going up to, well, let's just stop at 20. Plenty of time to stop, block, and kill. Bang, 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 bang. Drive away. Make the call. Either one of those time periods, plenty of time for this murder to occur. And if it wasn't that, there's always the mute button on his cell phone that you've seen in evidence. Greg Rude. Alonda Cheney. Well, tell me, honey, how you want me to change? And hit the mute button. He's probably got 15 minutes he doesn't need to reply. Sharika Adams called 911 at 12:31:31. Ray Carruth arrived at Hannibal Navy's house at the end of that call, about 15 minutes, 12:45 p.m. approximately. He's ready to fill in the back end of his alibi. He's joking. He's happy. He thinks his Sharika problem is solved. Tanya Ferguson said she went upstairs, went to bed. And she told you her cell phone is identical to Ray Caruso. They commented about it before, and it was downstairs. At 1.37 in the morning, there's a cell phone call from Tanya Ferguson's cell phone to the Villager Lodge. And I submit to you, Ray Carruth is trying to get a hold of Van, Ru Van Watkins to find out whether there was any problems after the killing. Did he get rid of the evidence? I'm going to pay you the rest of the money. He's trying to get a hold of Van Watkins, mistaken Tanya's phone for his. Then, at 1.40 in the morning on Tanya Ferguson's call, there's a call to Michael Kennedy's cell phone. 
Now, before that, at 1.46 in the morning, after he's arrived at Hannibal Navy's house, Carruth is not giving up on this Candace Smith involved in his alibi. Tend to. And at 1.46, he calls her and he says, I want you to come over. And she says, I told you I'm not coming over. Well, at least meet me for breakfast. And he talks and talks. She says, well, maybe I'll meet you for breakfast. And yeah, she goes ahead and orders from the Waffle House. She told you on the stand, and I, I was thinking that I just might stand him up for a change. But then she decides she's going to go on and meet him for breakfast. And he's told her, what I want you to do, I know you don't know where Hamble's house is, but it's real close to the service station there at the intersection of Providence Road and 485. You just go to that service station, I'll meet you there and we'll go get something to eat. She gets to the service station. No Ray Carruth. She waits. She waits. No Ray Carruth. Done it to me again. She gets her phone. She starts calling. She calls Hannibal's house. I think she said she called and poured to the phone records five times to Hannibal's house. She's not getting anybody at Hannibal's house. What's that all about? She gives up and she starts back to her place. And as she's riding along, heading back home, she gets a cell phone call from Ray Carruth. Phone records show at 3 o'clock in the morning. Calls her and tells her, Sharika Adams has been shot. She's in the hospital. I'm going to the hospital. Candace Smith, 3 o'clock in the morning, volunteers to go with him, to be with him. And she does. So, where is, is Ray Carruth when Candace is trying to call him at, at Hannibal's house and at his house? Yeah. What's going on there? We know Sandra Adams, according to Jeff Mooney, had called Ray Carruth's home when she got to Carolina's Medical Center. She left a message. Sharika has been shot. What's going on? You need to tell us what you've been doing. Said she called him twice at home. Once before Jeff got there and once in his presence. The second call, he was there when she called Ray Carruth and left that message. And said that right after she wasn't able to reach him a second time at home, she paged him. Right after that, she paged him and left that, um, I don't have one of those pagers, but apparently you can feed in a message and people can read it on the pager. But the calls to Carol from Carolina's Medical Center to Ray Carew's home, according to the phone records, were at 1.57 and 2 o'clock in the morning. And the page to Ray Carew was right after that. Jeff Mooney said it was an hour, hour and a half after the page before the defendant got to Carolina's Medical Center. Tend to you at two o'clock in the morning or shortly thereafter. Ray Carew knew Shuri Gattles in the hospital. People were suspicious. What to do between two o'clock, three o'clock? What am I going to do? Why? Five shots and she's still alive. Holy smoke. Well, one thing he did, he called Michael Kennedy, tried to. That's when that call on Tanya Ferguson's phone, 208 in the morning, trying to decide his next move. <clears throat> Another thing about these phone records, you remember Sergeant Athey testified that on the 24th, the day before Thanksgiving, the day before Ray Carruth was arrested for attempted murder of Sharika Adams, he came to the law enforcement center. They told him his car was ready, his expedition was ready. And he came down there and Sergeant Athey uh, showed him that they had got these phone records, that, that they can do this. They can just go get your phone records of your cell phone and it shows what time you made calls and to whom. So what are, these, what are these calls of this, uh, these people? 
Well, we asked Mike. I met him at a rim shop, uh, and uh, that's. Uh, well, how about this call? What about this number? Which number? Which number is that? You know, right here, the Villager Lodge. Oh, that call. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, that's new. Um, he lives out there. He details my cars. So. And then when he leaves there, after it's been revealed to him that they can just pull down his calls and have evidence of it, he goes to Panther Detailing to get his car. He's got his cell phone right with him. We know it's working because they have phone records on calls that were made that day from that same cell phone. What does he do? He goes in there and he calls what? The Villager Lodge. Three times. Three calls that were somehow not included in Ron Jarrett's analysis uh, of these phone records. Ray Carruth. given a lot of gifts by God. Incredible athletic ability. Charm. Oozes. Those God-given gifts enabled him to get an education, put himself in a position for wealth and fame that few will ever experience. So it comes to Charlotte. Got him out of the hood, as David Rudolph said in open statement. Comes to Charlotte, all that's going for him. What does he do? Starts hanging with the likes of Michael Kennedy, Van Watkins. <coughs> Stealing satellite TV signals with his buddy, Melvin Billingsley. Hanging at strip joints with Hannibal Nates, all the while ignoring his son. After he's arrested, he writes to Amber Turner in just one of these 15 points, number 13, talking about the mother of his son, Michelle Wright. She was horrible, and I was upset and cried a lot about being so far away from him and her being able to tell me when I could or couldn't see my son. I cried a lot. Is that true, Em? Nope. You remember Tanya Ferguson testifying when the next time he talked to me from the jail, he said, you remember there at the hospital how I cried? Y'all saw that side of me, you remember? And then he calls Tanya Ferguson from the jail. What's this? Tanisha hollers at you. Tanisha Huckleberry, who did holler at her and talk about her phone records, showing those calls that he made that morning to Michael Kennedy. That's okay, Steve, thank you. To Michael Kennedy and the Villager Lodge. Why? Because that's the kind of guy we do this.
take our uh, lunch and recess at this time until 1.30. Please keep in mind and abide by my instructions as to your conduct that I've continued to remind you of throughout these proceedings. They still apply to you, of course, at this stage. You're free to step out. We'll see you after lunch at 1.30.